Um, so I have a lot of interesting paradigms to present, uh, shifting the focus back to a more general conversation of uh, something that is not on the title, actually, the notion of idioms of distress, uh, which is a very cool concept in medical anthropology to study the ways in which people together attempt to make sense of uh, ways of being unwell. Uh, so I'll talk a bit about that. And of course, one question uh, that we might ask together is, is ADHD an idiom of distress? If so, what kind of idiom of distress is it? So the only thing I wanna mention about the presentation uh, to kind of guide your thinking for the second part of today's lecture is uh, going back to this very interesting video uh, from uh, the New York Times team uh, discussing the potential problem of overdiagnosis. Um, and uh, you all know that I'm typically not a big fan of the kind of social theory that too quickly can be summed up as a conspiracy theory. For example, Big Pharma has vested interest in manipulating people uh, into buying into some fake socially constructed diseases. Well, again, that may or may not be the case. However, uh, I do want to point out something that the journalist also pointed out, which is that uh, families and parents themselves come to physician asking for a diagnosis and asking for medication. So it could be the case that they have been manipulated by big pharma, we'll talk about it, or other things might be at stake. So those of you who will become clinicians, I have mentioned this before, will often find yourself in the difficult position of having to say no. People will come having an explanatory model, having an idea, an idiom of distress that they want you to validate, and having a particular treatment that they already have in mind that they want as consumer times, um, you might have to step in and say, well, let's just take a moment to think about what's going on and let's just discuss it before validating what you want right now as a consumer. So is it the case that there is a big pharma conspiracy, we might even call it that, uh, to peddle dangerous expensive pills onto people who may not need them? Well, perhaps. Let's remain agnostic about that. But Let's try to understand and explicitate the mechanisms by which people will actually accept that this is what they need. Because those people who work in marketing and neuromarketing, for example, know that you can't just sell anything to anyone. Um, supposing that there was a, a big conspiracy uh, to impose or to wanna sell all, I don't know, 85 volumes of the Babylonian Talmud to everyone for everyone to become a Talmud scholar, that just wouldn't work. People would not be interested no matter how aggressively you peddle the Talmud at them. In fact, there is such a conspiracy uh, from the Chabadniks uh, who are in the business of recruiting secular Jews back into a pious life, but most people just use Chabad centers abroad for a free Shabbat dinner and an opportunity to just hang out uh, with people and make friends. So if the big pharma uh, industrial complex works, um, it's because before even peddling pills, it is peddling narratives that are like brain candy for people. People love uh, a very simple, catchy story about what's wrong with their children's brain uh, or their own brain for that matter. People seek, as we will see, an explanatory model that typically involves an external locus of control, an agency other than the conscious self, be it neurotransmitters or ancestors, uh, or, or toxins that explains everything. And they want a simple answer. I take this pill once a day, it does this thing to my brain and I'm going to be uh, okay. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we, could, we could go back to a few of these questions. So I want today's lecture to be a continuation of uh, the central thesis, the homofragilist thesis that I've presented in this class, which is that, uh, and I did not formulate it in the way that I'm about to, but one way to understand the struggle of human history, one day to understand the master-slave dialectic as Hegel and Marx would have had it. So this idea that history is constituted by a struggle between the oppressors and the oppressed, and that eventually the slaves or the oppressed rise back, they become masters themselves, and so history goes. My way of conceiving this dynamic is as a dialectic or struggle between caregivers and care receivers. And I'm in particular interested in the agency of the care receivers and the tyranny 
if you will, of those who demand infinite care from others. So I'm interested in these and these mechanisms. So these are just some, a few quotes, some of which that I've presented that I think help me understand uh, the, the context. So the, the first one is from uh, Caroline Eliashev, who's a French psychoanalyst um, who wrote a prophetic book in the late 1990s about the culture of victimhood. There were a few interesting books in France at the time um, from psychoanalysts and social theorists who had perceived the, the, the seeds of a culture of victimhood being planted in the collective unconscious. Uh, and so the authors there were trying to understand, well, why is it that so much of, uh, so many of the demands we hear nowadays uh, could be summarized as, you know, the, the collective or the community owes me everything and I, and I owe them nothing. If you have followed me in, uh, in my thesis so far in these lectures, you will guess that uh, from the perspective of homo fragilis, there's nothing wrong or nothing new or nothing particularly unusual about this dynamic because this is how the human species survived. A child is infinitely vulnerable, infinitely dependent on the group, and a child is owed care by everyone else. The question then is, how does a child at some point become autonomous, become independent? How does a child become a caregiver herself? So Freud liked to speak of his majesty, the baby. And in the Freudian formulation, at some point, the baby has to step off his narcissistic throne and come to understand others as persons who are also um, It may or may not be that more and more in our weird societies, we are moving towards societies of, of his majesty, the baby. But from this perspective, again, the master has to understand the slave more than the other way around. And here I'm just being Socratic and provocative, but you could also say the parent, the teacher, the doctor, the clinician has to understand the patient more than the patient understands the doctor. So typically a child has much less empathy for a parent simply because the child has not herself had the opportunity to be in the shoes of the parent and to, be, um, and to be a caregiver. So we can cast aside the question of victimhood for now. We can, we can return to it. Uh, many contemporary cultural commentators are a little puzzled as to why it is a condition of victimhood that appears to uh, get one so much social currency these days, at least in elite weird circles. Um, so why don't people compete for strength, for autonomy, for fulfillment, for enjoyment, for jouissance, the way the first generations of, uh, say, 1968 people, our parents or my parents, uh, who was the first generation to turn their back away from tradition and obligations in pursuit of individual enjoyment. So why, why is it about suffering? Why competitive suffering rather than uh, competitive jouissance? So, okay, so I'll skip the sacred stuff because I've spoken about it um, a little bit, but the thesis I will keep advancing is that people are mostly competing for narratives, for moral models of how to understand the world and how to be in the world. And in particular, people are competing for idioms of distress, for whose narrative to explain suffering is the most correct, and whose narrative must be adopted. So the notion of idioms of distress has become a bit blurred in medical anthropology, but it goes back to the works of medical anthropologist Arthur Kleinman, a uh, Harvard medical anthropologist who's also a medical doctor, and his work on explanatory models and his work on depression in China initially. And then there has been, uh, after a wave of rather orientalizing, somewhat exoticizing study of so-called culture-bound syndrome, so culturally specific ways of being unwell, there's been a return to a uh, pretty exciting conversation uh, about idioms of distress, which, which here, I'm taking the liberty, drawing on the literature, to define as um, a set of beliefs, so culturally postulated, meaning that uh, members of certain cultural groups have certain assumptions about what is true in the world. I also like the metaphor of the assumptive world. Uh, this is 
the, the psychiatrist and psychoanalyst Jerome Frank, who said that a, a person's lived experience is constituted of the totality of assumptions that they have about what is true in the world, what will arise in their experience, what they will get from the world. So people have different assumptive worlds and they, they compete for them. Uh, so not just from one culture to the next, but also within one family, within a couple. Uh, note how in sibling rivalry or in arguing with your parents about uh, whose version of the past is truer, there is always an attempt to recruit your interlocutor into your assumptive world. Jerome Frank, by the way, believed that psychotherapy was one of the most violent, most aggressive forms of indoctrination into the therapist assumptive world. So the patient comes with a set of explanations about their distress and you gaslight them and you tell them, no, this is what's going on with your life. Um, mm -hmm. Psychoanalysis on the other end, hand has always attempted to resist suggestion and to just let the patient confront herself, uh, but not to impose an explanatory framework, which is very difficult to do, but is however honest. Um, so, a set of beliefs, practices, um, narratives, expectations to explain and remediate suffering. And chiefly, crucially, an idiom of distress contains an explanatory model that has a, identifies a postulated cause for the distress. And then, think again, think of it as a cultural package. Think of it as, as a software package. Uh, that, that you download from the internet that updates your iPhone, that updates your brain and your body, because idioms of distress, like most of our culturally postulated beliefs, are partially re reflective. Um, you can partially retrieve them from your memory, discuss them, explain them to others, but they're partially unconscious as well. So often we, we adopt a whole pack cultural package without really being fully aware that, that we do. So an idiom of distress also contains expectations about the phenomenological presentation. So I have condition X, therefore I must feel Y. I have ADHD because my frontal lobes are impaired, therefore I won't be able to sit down. So you expect you won't be able to sit down or uh, you won't be able to keep a steady job or I'm not sure what the expectation would be. And expectations about the course of illness, the prognosis, is it supposed to get better? Does it get better as you grow up? Does, does it not get better? And then specific ritual prescriptions for the cure. So do you uh, go see a, a shaman at the top of a mountain? Do you sacrifice a, a black hen reciting an incantation? Or do you, uh, do you go to this sacred pharmacy place uh, with these neatly packaged bottles and you take these pills at uh, ritually prescribed times? So those are all examples of rituals of cure. Here I am again discussing anthropological invariants, things that you will find in every culture around the questions of distress. Idioms of distress um, can cover the full range of, of, of ailments in the world, but they're particularly pertinent when discussing the forms of distress that we now call psychopathological or mental that we postulate to exist in this metaphysical mental realm the precise nature of which we have, of course, not been able to ascertain. So uh, allow me to once more uh, put forth the important point um, that the diagnostic validity of mental illnesses and psychopathological conditions is very, very fuzzy. One does not diagnose a mental illness or even a neurodevelopmental condition or disorder the way one, the way a blood test can diagnose the presence of infection, uh, determine which parasite or which bacteria, and then you, which antibiotic agent will best respond um, or work with this particular infection. It's exceedingly complicated. As we will see when we discuss the clusters, there are some conditions, in particular schizophrenia in the psychotic continuum, that may be a little bit more objectively identifiable, including uh, the postulated brain basis of those conditions. But even then, we'll talk about this. There are plenty of people who hear voices and they don't have a problem. They don't otherwise exhibit disorganized thought. They're fine. They just talk to their dead grandma and it's okay. Um, and in fact, um, I know of many, many cases uh, where precise diagnostic accuracy eludes even the best clinicians. 
So I'm fortunate every Wednesday morning religiously to attend a three hour round of clinical case discussion at the clinical polarization team with Professor C headed by Professor Cecile Rousseau. And we discuss in depth um, the particular problems surrounding the life histories of our patients. And we're fortunate to have a lot of triangulated information. Some of our patients um, had extended stays in mental hospitals where, or including the ones with the criminally insane where they un underwent a broad battery of tests. We're also able to go and interview other clinicians, uh, other family members. In fact, it's, it's a little bit like, to me, my narration is it feels like being doctor, the Dr. House show with Cecile Rousseau is Dr. House, and she gives all, all kinds of crazy counterintuitive advice to make sense of what's going on in the lives of patients. And then she sends us on a sleuthing mission um, to try to find out what's going on. And there are many patients I can think of where, who have been seen for years and years, and we have no idea if they're psychotic or not. They could be fooling us. They could be fooling themselves. We just have no idea what's going on. Um, so as much as our brain, our cultures, our institutions, like simple catchy stories, identifying a clear cause, mental conditions are extremely elusive. So we're now in a historical moment where um, the idea of the brain and brain sciences and the idea of brain chemistry has a lot of narrative and cultural currency, but we're still nowhere near uh, the beginning of of an understanding of, of what is going on. Now, when you examine the narrative structure of an idiom of distress, like an explanatory model, you will almost always, always find the postulation, so the, the, the supposition that something exists of a rather magical, fuzzy, or metaphysical, typically an invisible entity that causes the distress. So I like to call it a, a polluted causal agency external to the cell. So again, in many cultures, it could be the spirits or the ancestors or the jinns or, or some witchcraft or other, or malocchio, uh, the, the evil eye. Um, in our culture, uh, neurotransmitters, uh, but also different kinds of nutritional metaphysical entities like gluten and, and uh, lactose and, and proteins and electrolytes or whatever have you, things that most people don't actually understand, right? Like we call that we routinely traffic in notions um, and metaphors under the impression that we understand what we're talking about, what thing of the world we, we're talking about that our, in, our interlocutor also understands, but really we're just, we're just talking about spirits and ancestors. It's, uh, it's the same kind of process. So the so-called external locus of control, which is in, in a very real sense, most of the time ontologically correct, at least in the sense that whatever is causing the distress is something external to that, that very, very tiny powerless part of your subjectivity that you mistake for you, for yourself, namely your reflective thoughts, your ability to think about your experiences, your free will, if it exists, however meager, it might be, it's, it's for sure not that that's causing your distress. So we, we try, we scan the imagined assumptive world to try to find a, a cause uh, of distress. So, 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 so here again, I, I, I absolutely put things like, yes, yeah, spike protein, you know, big pharma, the patriarchy, but you know, similarly with, you know, uh, from an extreme right perspective, everything is because of feminism, because of uh, because of multiculturalism, because of liberalism, because of uh, because of wokeism. It, it's it's the same. It's just an external uh, an external entity that it, that explains everything. Now, having secured an explanatory model, having identified a metaphysical, fuzzy, invisible cause, one then seeks, one then expects the ritual of cure, um, remember? And, and there goes the search for purity, typically. So this is another anthropological invariance, the sacred and the taboo, the polluted and the pure, the search for the elimination of what is dirty, what is impure, 
and the search for cleanliness and for purity. Most of the time, um, when we're dealing with something in, in the mental category, but I would argue that applies to things like very physical things like cancers and tumor, tumors, we attempt to restore an idealized self devoid of the polluted elements. So there enter the rituals of cure that typically entail rituals of eliminations, which um, as we will see, mostly entail what we do not do as opposed to what we do. So yes, you, you take a few pills, uh, but a lot of the time we, we like to create all kinds of restrictions in particular dietary restriction. So, so I, I have too many people's chagrin or, or, or irony at times theorized the explosive rise of dietary restrictions among millennials and Generation Z as an attempt to reinvent culture because culture was destroyed, there's nothing left. I exaggerate. So let's reinvent cash root or you know, whatever kind of way we can demarcate ourselves as pure people as different from the impure people. So things we don't touch, uh, things that we avoid so as not to compromise the integrity of our idealized pure self. What I find interesting is that, again, particularly around things like mental illness, um, recall I said, the lower the threat, the higher the anxiety, by which I mostly meant the most vague the threat, the higher the anxiety, and the higher the conflict in particular. So if someone has a broken or someone is, uh, has a visible handicap, is in a, is in a wheelchair, often there's not much uh, contesting because it's there, it's visible. However, when it comes to invisible forms of distress, they're typically, we typically find a degeneration into some kind of a culture war between those who believe in idiom of distress A and those who believe in idiom of distress B, which is typically idiom of distress not A. So we see a, in terms of cultural evolution, a co-construction of related narratives, idiom of distress narratives, with a lot of conflict around a narcissism of small differences. So these are people who largely recognize each other as accountable to the same norms, but they agree on the terms of the, they disagree on the terms of the game. And very often one will find identities built around the form of distress, its prevention, and conflict with other people who don't believe in your identity because there's nothing worse for a human to feel invalidated as who they are. So we see a lot, uh, well, we see a lot of these nowadays. In other words, we can again explain explicitly the conflict between say those who believe in fibromyalgia, those who don't, those who believe in trans identity and those who don't, those who believe in uh, gluten intolerance and those who don't as epistemic conflict around explanatory models uh, where members of each group have at stakes the defense of the integrity of their narrative first and then the set of beliefs and ritual prescriptions about about how to live well now i have presented idioms of distress in a rather social constructivist fashion in one that is either agnostic about or critical of the veracity of the claims contained within the narrative. Idioms of distress can be partially or entirely true or partially or entirely false in terms of a correct understanding uh, of causality in terms of uh, what I sometimes like to call Buddhist understanding because I, I recall a, um, a grand Buddhist Lama in the Himalayas telling me the goal of Buddhism is to understand true cause and effect. And I thought, wow, that, that's cool. It sounds like science. <laughs> um, so most of the time, idioms of distress are partially true and then partially constructed in the sense that things become true because people expect them. So here I'm gonna take 
what used to not be controversial, but what has become controversial again, a rather dry empirical position. And I'm gonna say most of the time, at least this is my belief that explaining a mental illness through spirit possession is empirically false. Well, at least I don't believe that it is the case. However, once you have a, an embodied practiced belief system of people who make sense of the world that way, people whose expectations are attuned to a world in which there are such things as spirits that may become phenomenologically true because you expect them to be part of the world, well then there, the belief system can loop back uh, to quote the philosopher of medicine, Ian Hacking, in his notion of looping effects. So by virtue of being recruited into or self-recruiting into a belief system, people start embodying um, the expected attributes of their assumptive world. I like to think of idioms of distress as partly pathogenic in the sense that, um, that they sometimes cause or induce nocebo effects where people will literally enact many of the symptoms that they expect to get by virtue of believing that they, they exist within this category, say ADHD or um, another contested one, seasonal depression. You'll find tons of papers and meta-analyses that say it's a thing, there's an effect, and others that say it's not a thing, there's no effect. Or insomnia. The idea that if you don't get your eight hours of sleep, you're going to be screwed. The science is all over the place for that. Some people say, no, it's more the expectations, the false beliefs about sleep that cause you to be impaired during the day. Others say, no, it's objectively. Well, again, we, we don't know. But I have mentioned this before. I'm interested in the thin boundaries between prophylaxis. and this. So prophylaxis means a ritual done. It's like a potropaic in anthropological terms something done to prevent the onset of a disease. So we talked about being prevention focused or being promotion focused. That was a, a very, uh, very interesting typology I find. And there are ways in being prevention focused, we're constantly rehearsing the anxiety of having something we do not yet have, thereby bringing it into being. Just like in hoping that something happens, we're cultivating the fear that it won't happen and we're just sabotaging ourselves. So this, this is an empirical question. I think when it comes to some conditions, some contexts, we have the answers that sometimes um, expecting something becomes phenomenologically true. And we're beginning to study the nocebo effect uh, rather belatedly, I would say. So a nocebo is simply a negative placebo. It's like reading the list of possible side effects from uh, a medication bottle and, and having them. I certainly recommend to those of you who identify as hypochondriacs to not read ever the list of possible side effects. Rather, if you get something for sure, like you've had it for two, three days, ask someone you trust, you know, ask, maybe ask them to look at the pill bottle for you. Um, so there's a small but exciting and very, very controversial body of research on the impact of the internet and internet forums and internet communities in the construction of new ways of being unwell and, and uh, of possible pathogenetic effects. Um, so we know that the internet is heavily implicated in, in the rise and spread of all kinds of body identification disorders, all kinds of amplifications of body dysmorphia, of eating disorders, of wanting to fit into the ideal types, culturally postulated ideal body types, and the enormous gaze uh, one feels subjected to online, having these, these in many ways, very toxic nocebo effects. But there's all kinds of uh, controversies about medically contested categories. So again, things like, things like irritable bowel syndrome, fibromyalgia, um, what's another one? Multiple chemical sensitivities, um, what's another one? Uh, Many, many of those conditions that you know, some physicians believe in, some don't, and typically 
the more contested a category, the more it will create a very, very defensive subculture group of people who have vested interest in explaining their distress and wanting to be recognized for their suffering and in wanting their uh, idiom of distress to be recognized. So I wanna draw a parallel with the notion of ergonomics uh, and what I call the ergonomics of fragility to understand or to try to understand, to try to explain and theorize pathogen pathogenetic mechanisms uh, that may contribute to making people more unwell by virtue of constantly building, the, like micromanaging the world to prevent being unwell and in doing so in perpetuating ways of being unwell. So I find the history and notion of ergonomics fascinating because I also find ergonomics as a concept to be very pathogenetic and very fragilizing. Um, so the naive definition of ergonomics, the one you will find in the dictionary explains that this is the science of the workplace, tools, equipment designed to reduce worker discomfort in my view, to produce it, uh, to reduce stress and fatigue and to prevent in my view, to produce uh, work-related injuries. In anthropological terms, I define it rather as a perform performative set of beliefs, discourses, practices, et cetera, that structure the expectation of people around the prevention of injury and the care that is owed to them. By performative, I mean, I go back to a long body of work in the philosophy of mind, the idea that language is not just descriptive, say the cat is on the mat, but it is performative. I pronounce you man and wife. So, or this is a girl, or this is a boy. This is Judith Butler's uh, creative use of the speech act theory. This idea that language does not quite or just describe the world, but it brings into be sense of affair. So the notion of speech act theory is important to understand placebo effects, to understand nocebo effects, to understand um, how our beliefs are performative. So the idea of expecting a workplace that comes with ergonomic modification to prevent, say, repetitive strain injury, which I'll talk about in a minute, it's a fascinating history of the construction of a contested diagnosis that actually radically transformed the world. But once we have ergonomic expectations, we also have an expectation that the environment is unsafe, that it can lead to injury, but also that we are fragile, that we are deserving of a particular kind of care and particular external modifications of the environment to prevent this injury. Remember again that this is not a moral story. Remember that the paradigms that have been presented recognize that mutual care is the human condition. The question rather is how to do it well, how to do it in ways that are mutually strengthening as opposed to ways that are mutually tyrannizing or fragilizing. And recall again that for humans, most of the time, a dangerous environment means filled with enemies who don't believe in our idiom of distress, meaning, say, people who do not believe that ergonomic modifications uh, are needed. So I've mentioned this before, but I want to spend a bit more time uh, discussing uh, the social construction of a, di of a diagnosis, recognizing again that with most idioms of distress, most of the time, part of the story is real. Now, repetitive strain injury, which is something that most of us have heard about, and, and perhaps for some of us, we already have a, a stereotype of a human resources worker in an office somewhere with a, a little sling for their carpal tunnel syndrome uh, and, and these really, really ugly ergonomic chairs and these modular computers. Um, it was until recently, something that we didn't know anything about. And it was for a while a hotly, hysterically contested illness. So the debate started in Australia in the 1980s and early 90s uh, when, when people felt chronically injured or were getting what we now understand to be ulnar nerve entrapment or carpal tunnel syndrome. But these were, and this is important and I'll get back to this, typically white collar or, or tertiarized economy service sector kind of grievances. So as we will see, there are ideas of grievances that are grievances that are borrowed from the blue collar context, but these are, uh, these are debates that arose first in a white collar context. 
So people feel unwell for all kinds of reasons. And, and, and I, for one, believe that service sector jobs are in many ways more alienating and more conducive to all kinds of abominable idioms of distress than blue collar context. And we, we can talk about that in a moment. So there are real and perceived injuries. There's, there's this vague sense of distress. There's bodily aches and pains. Uh, you may know I have mentioned that in many idioms of distress around the world to describe what Western people call depression, aches and pains, or aching joints, say in many East Asian cultures, there's a, a recognition or a postulation of, of aching joints. So led to first the folk formulation of something called a, a repetitive strain um, injury. There, thereby ensued, uh, and this happens most of the time, a fight between uh, the employees and the unions who wanted to be compensated and the insurance companies and the bosses who didn't want to pay for it, who didn't want workers to take time off. It, it, it's important um, to look, and it sounds a little Talmudic and juridical and boring, but in the construction of most medical categories that we come to take for granted now, there's typically some kind of a battle between unions, uh, trade unions, and insurance companies, be they public, like say, you know, public health here in Quebec, or also private insurance companies, in order for something ontologically to be deemed to exist and worthy of compensation, pragmatically, it needs to be recognized by insurance companies. So a small side note on the DSM-5, uh, which is often criticized for, for having cancerously grown in thickness and in detail as compared to previous editions, a lot of pragmatically minded, compassionate physicians say, yes, we did it on purpose because we want these people to be compensated. For example, there was a big debate on grief on, uh, on grief from losing a, lof, a lost one, which somehow appears in the DSM. What, you mean losing a loved one is a mental illness? No, no, say the compassionate pragmatic clinician. We understand that there's a normal process of grieving, that it's hard, but we wanted people to get compensated, to be able to go to their insurance company and say, uh, I can actually take time off because I'm too unwell to work. But for the... I mean, it's a bunch of medical sociologists to work on the case studies of, of RSI, but it's, it's really fascinating to look at the history and archaeology of the construction of medical categories and looking at activism in, in trade union newsletters and then uh, court transcript with expertise and counter expertise. Right now, again, there is this battle is going on around the question of transgender identity, for example, with, you know, expertise and counter expertise. And there's all these questions. Does it exist? What is it? Um, it's very interesting. What we note from the moment that RSI becomes a legit bona fide thing that is compensated, that is recognized by insurance companies, is that symptoms are on the rise for all kinds of complicated reasons. We discussed this in the instance of PTSD, for example, where we see a second wave of the late onset uh, of symptoms of PTSD from Vietnam veterans in the late 90s, uh, when all of a sudden uh, a lot of compensation and benefits were no longer accessible to people. So the condition flares up. Um, remember again that uh, certainly I am not concerned with people who are faking it. Those who fake it, good for them. They know how to game the system. They're, they're clever. Um, there's not much of a problem there. The problem rather is when do people become sincerely convinced that they have a condition that they may not have had, or they may have adopted another idiom of distress? Um, that becomes a, a much more interesting question. So there are still people who, uh, who are on the, the critical side about a lot of these medically contested categories, including people who get repeated RSI, so the old psychoanalytic formulation of a conversion disorder, which we later called a somatoform disorder, or simply something that is psychosomatic, well, the, the question uh, still looms. But it's interesting that once a new category is culturally, institutionally, bureaucratically, economically accepted, then we will expect symptoms to be on the rise. There you have a new idiom of distress. At the time of the RSI battles, there were the more critically minded medical sociologists who would say, no, what we're seeing here is compensation neurosis. Um, 
composition neurosis is interesting. It had been documented, in fact, in the Francophone literature much earlier in France in the early 1900s under the name of sinistrose in the context of train accidents. So this is a, another interesting parallel, but those of you who ever want to take a deep dive even into the history of trauma, uh, PTSD and psychic injury, something interesting happens with the railroad and a complete break in temporality, uh, the ability to just uh, go from A to B, very, very fast uh, lapse in amount of time and very, very spectacular accidents that in terms of people's assumptive worlds at the time, were a complete rupture in terms of their expectations. So, um, so it appears as though, and I think, yeah, I believe it was Charles Dickens himself suffered from, uh, I forget the name of the folk formulation at the time, but he had some kind of a post railroad accident, uh, long-term traumatic response that inspired his desire to, uh, to document the lives of the poor. But what's interesting in compensation neurosis is that, and let's again assume that most people are not faking it, but that the, the presence in one's expectation of the possibility of compensation, of the possibility of financial compensation, but I am much more interested in emotional compensation, in social compensation, in cultural compensation, and I'll get there in a minute. This idea of you can be seen, you can be recognized, you can be valued, as a deserving victim tends to amplify. It provides an invitation for the symptoms to flare up because it is adaptive or is it maladaptive so as to become a, uh, a recipient of care. So in compensation neurosis, we find people who have a theory, an explanatory model about some kind of injury, psychic, bodily, or otherwise, or both having been unduly done to them in a context, and they will persist with obstinacy in the quest for recognition and in the quest for, uh, for benefits. So I'm again, most of the literature is, in my view, too narrowly focused on financial compensation. Yes, financial compensation matters. It seems to me that for humans, that emotional and social compensation is, is what matters uh, the most. So uh, it's, it's interesting to work in both French and English and to have to retranslate my work several times. I, I discovered that repetitive strain injury in French, at least in, in FFF, French from France, is called microtrauma, a microtrauma. I find that interesting because um, in the 1980s, the idea of a microtrauma was, was very novel. It elicited puzzlement and very reflexive conversation. But now in our current world, We've, we take it for granted that things like micro injuries and micro psychic injuries and, and micro aggressions are things of the world. So I find the disembodied cultural evolution of these concepts very interesting. And I'll, and I'll explain that again, this idea that we historically come from vi grievances um, and forms of injuries that were much more physical, that were much more noticeable to increasingly metaphysical, vague, uh, elusive, and, and fuzzy forms, forms of injuries. So a kind of a historical disembodiment that, that I find uh, very interesting. So I wanna talk about the concept of this battle between, uh, between trade unions um, and those who don't want to pay for compensation, I think this is, this is a very, very important battle, but many, many things happened to our society since the 1960s, uh, one of which is the tertiarization, which means a shift towards third sector service economies, primarily in the West, in weird countries. So the demise of, uh, of working class jobs, deindustrialization, relocation, and a massive shift towards uh, more kind of service sector, one which I have already defined um, not as a, as a moral quality, but as being, as being more feminized. So first in the sense that more and more, um, more and more as women have entered the workforce, um, there are more women, young workers, unless you go to sort of the higher 
top earning kind of echelons. But also in the sense of favoring the kinds of docility that was historically imposed more so on women than on men. So favoring the kinds of meek, obedient, predictable, the, the sort of the, the, the tyranny of the safety obsessed uh, human resources. What I find interesting, and we see this very clearly with the idea of repetitive swing injuries and microtrauma, and we're gonna see it more and more with the types of grievances and claims that we hear nowadays, is that there's an appropriation of historically uh, blue collar grievances. Now, there are workplaces, there still are nowadays, that are mostly masculinized, uh, in which uh, one runs the risk of, of having one's limbs ripped, or, and in fact, uh, a lot of workplace-related injuries and death still happen. These are actually physically dangerous workplaces. When it comes to the, um, the grievances of exploited workers, again, think of, most of you, I assume, are roughly familiar with the kind of 19th century London described by Karl Marx, where all of a sudden uh, people are working 12 hours a day in, in, in conditions of abject poverty and exploitation. So there was historically a, a necessary, uh, but also easier to understand, more ontologically real in the sense that there's clear exploitation that we can identify, a clear danger. And then there are gains, historically, gains from the, the slave class. What I find particularly interesting, and this is what I call the unionization of emotions, which I find roughly characterizes the kinds of subjectivities uh, that are in currency and in production nowadays. The notion of emotional labor, fascinating. Some of you, uh, perhaps from gender studies, are familiar with a paradigm, uh, a paradigm from the sociologist Early Hostchak, who was referring to those particularly feminized spheres of labor, like say being, being waitresses or flight attendants in which mostly women employees had to effortfully perform emotions and positive affect for the purpose of customer satisfaction. So repress your own emotions and effortfully perform. Arlie Hauschild now has come and there's an interview of her in The Atlantic where uh, I believe I'm quoting her verbatim. She says she is horrified by the way in which her notion of emotional labor was appropriated to describe things like arguing over, you know, who takes out the trash or something like that. So she distinguished emotion work from emotion work, which in, in her view was uh, the affects that are involved in the things we do at home, say domestic labor, from emotional labor. What I find particularly interesting about not early Hauschild, that was just interesting in another empirical sense. She noted there's a particular emotional tax that comes with having to perform in situations of relative alienation. But, but again, she was already talking about a context in which those gains of the first, gen, first and second generation trade unions were there most of the time. Notice the way in which in common day parlance, the concept of labor, but effort and activity is, is borrowed from these old blue collar industrial grievances to denote some kind of an injury against the self where, and here this is the most caric the caricature of this version where doing anything for others is seen as a form of unjust labor. So I'm aware of, of some blog posts. It's, it's interesting because emotional labor as a concept went first in the sociology of emotions uh, and then it was taken up in quite nuanced feminist scholarship. But now if you Google it, if you Google examples of emotional labor, you'll find a lot of wellness coaches, wellness and spirituality coaches who have the usual list. Some of you have seen them. So things that is said to typically befall on women in a domestic arrangement. So things like uh, remembering how to send thank you cards and writing Christmas cards and uh, remembering you know, that the kids have to be fed and remembering the schedules and the, sort of the emotional labor involved with that. But of course, one might be compelled to ask, well, why is it a grievance to contribute to the well-being of a household, to do something for others? So this idea of effort, of self-regulation, of being confronted 
as exploitation has gained a lot of currency. And it seems to me it, it stems that there's a particular industrial trajectory where it is not so much the industrial grievance that is being appropriated, but the benefits, the trade union benefits that we have come to expect or the ergonomic modifications that we have come to expect to make sure that our contributions to the world and to others do not lead to injuries and to, uh, to micro injuries. So this idea that in domestic labor, certainly in building a couple, uh, in, in, in building a family, um, in arguing over who takes out the trash and who did the dishes and whose turn it is to clean the toilet, we have also appropriated and extended a set of expectations about safe, compensated hours. We, we have taken the post-industrial, post-unionized uh, insurance benefit workplace into our everyday affects. And thereby come uh, an increasingly messy uh, competition of individualistic ergonomic demands to have our suffering recognized, in my view, per per uh, perpetuated, and, and so on um, and so forth. Oh, that, that was good. That's it. So I welcome challenges, questions, comments. Uh, if this doesn't make any sense, good, let's talk about it. Uh, if some of you disagree, uh, let's talk about it. But um, so we can go back to idioms of distress, um, but I'd love to get some feedbacks and some challenges on the idea that the effects um, have become unionized. And recall, this is not an anti-union argument. They, they were very, very needed um, historically. Mm -hmm. Fine line between like in the work environment actually being exploited and like that idea in general of like you know, the boss exploiting the workers uh, and that kind of bleeding into work environments that aren't toxic. So like Obviously, there are places where unions are very needed because, of course, otherwise, like you know, the workers would just work till they drop and with no pushback at all. Of course, but on an admittedly somewhat romantic view, going back to the proposition that the lower the threat, the higher the anxiety, it is precisely in those parts of the world or in those workspaces and places where people are actually exploited, um, that you find on average a level of resilience that our perpetually micro injured, overly safe world no longer produces somehow. Um, where again, the, the threshold for what is considered a toxic workplace, indeed a toxic environment of any kind, a toxic relationship, the injunction, eliminate all toxic people from your life, right? This is a very dear to our generation. There, there, is, there is something odd there. Um, but unionization, what we call unionization is, is not new. Um, sheer exploitation cannot go on forever. Um, uh, a master, however authoritarian and however profiteering he might be, has to be able to care for his subject in some way or other. Otherwise, demands, demands will come. And so, and the master slave dialectic keeps, keeps running. There is no such thing as a concept in which people are just slaves uh, forever. Yes? Um, I don't know exactly how it, um... Okay, my, my comments probably got 
challenge the, the view, but um, I found this really interesting parallel when I started to think about that. I was thinking about the resilience of assets and like having um, these like core beliefs or like preconceptions and how they kind of impact like our, our actions. And I, I drew a parallel to like um, different sports and injury within sport, because you'll see in, in some sports, like um, and hockey is just a, a certain example where someone goes and gets hit and has 50 stitches. That's so culturally embedded in the sport that like no matter what happens to you, unless you're told you can't come back, you will. But then in other sports, um, other sports, some like maybe a tiny sprain or other things that are just like culturally like, um, I mean, it, it, obviously there are individuals and that's a generalization, but um, it's just kind of interesting to see that um, sometimes people have broken bones and because they have these preconceptions that no matter what they need to come mm -hmm. back. So I, I just find it kind of interesting when you don't even have that ideological option that that you're able to to be injured or to not come back into a into some sort of performance. It's kind of kind of interesting. Yes, one, one could draw a good parallel here is in defining sport as the practice of some kind of bodily virtuosity, right? That requires effort and training. If you take a white collar sport, like classical musicianship, you can think of it as a white collar sport. And one, one can get really debilitating tendonitis and, and it might seem odd. For, however, something that comes with industrialization for actually agrarianization and then industrialization, then post-industrialization is, is alienation, is, is, is being cut off from broader possibilities of being. Uh, so hockey is still a generalist sport in the sense that you use most of your body. Whereas if you're a professional violinist, you're repeating the same, you're already more like an industrial worker who's performing the same task, you know, leading to, uh, to actual strength and leading to feet. Um, of the rest of the body. So, so there are indeed many, 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 many factors in, in what's going on with contemporary fragility. This does not seek to explain everything, but it seeks to identify some, some narrative dimensions uh, and some, some dimensions of the structuring of subjectivities and people's expectations in terms of their relation with other people and, and with their bodies. But I like the sports example, that's good. Could, could people think of um, another contemporary idiom of distress, something that is not typically explained uh, in such terms? So I've given some examples, micro traumas, micro injuries, irritable bowel syndrome. Um, yes. Chronic fatigue? Yeah. Sure. I would say chronic fatigue is a prime candidate for a complex existential problem uh, and attempts to reduce it to, to one bodily mechanism. Yes? I'm not sure how exactly to like, like you would phrase it, but maybe like the um, work hard, play hard attitude that a lot of like um, university students might have, where it's almost um, students try to like one up each other by saying like, oh, well, I did this much work and I only got this many hours of sleep and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Well, also still, you know, wanting to prove that you have some kind of social life and that you, you know, you have friends and that kind of thing. I would call that an, idi an idiom of resilience. Um... However, one where the bar might be very high in terms of what individual bodies can take. Uh, but those of you who go on to medical school or elite military training, whatever it might be, the, the human body can take quite a bit. Do you think also like hair loss in people who want to like, turn the stress or you see like um, 
whenever somebody's like panicking or start like pulling like pulling some hair or whatnot, or even just like little bits of hair loss. I know that like my friend feels a little bit worse too. But she ends up getting like really stressed out again this month because she ends up losing like a lot of hair. So I used to think that hair loss was a fairly simple physiological phenomenon with multiple pathways from hormonal pathways. Uh, but then we start talking about stress and then it gets more complicated. And then, and then I read, because uh, I'm always very interested in the placebo data from randomized control trials, right? I, I want to see just how high were the placebo effects. And I realized that uh, in, in hair growth products for men, <laughs> um, there are sometimes pretty high placebo effects. So people who are in the placebo group are able to regrow. And we're not talking like, you know, full Brad Pitt head of hair, but they're able to regrow hair. So, so it, yeah, it, it could be, it could be. Um, so, but, but now we get into the, the so-called active placebo and active nocebo range, right? Sometimes there's a real mechanism of action that we've empirically demonstrated to be the case. And then there's a somatic amplification because of the added load from the expectations, be, be they positive uh, or negative. Um, so let's think of another one with a pretty high placebo load. It's a difficult conversation because it often seems as though the real claim being made is that some category of distress is fake as opposed to another one that might be more real. And that's complicated. And we find that the most heated, virulently heated arguments have questions of distress and people who feel that they're suffering, which is always real, um, is not being recognized. So around questions like uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, irritable bowel syndrome, fibromyalgia, but also ADHD, this is when people, even in um, very respectable medical conferences, will scream at each other. Um, people get really, really riled up and really, really angry. Um, with those. But of course, in a medical anthropology class, we have to, we have to discuss those. It doesn't mean we're uh, taking party clearly to the ontological status of these, but we want to elicit some thinking about what's going on. We can go back to ADHD. How real do people think it is? Go on. Going from personal experience, I'm like pretty sure I have ADHD. I've never like gone to see someone and get diagnosed, but I have like a lot of the behavior. Mm -hmm. um, and like going to my family and stuff. Uh, but I can't guarantee that I actually have it or that I would get diagnosed with it. And I guess I sometimes use it as a bit of a crutch on something like why I'm not able to listen to someone talk about something I don't want to listen to. So like, I don't know, just like why I can't focus or something or why I couldn't get my work done on time or anything like that. I guess that's kind of- Yeah, so here's an interesting question. When is a diagnosis a license to be unwell? Is another way to ask the question. You you had your hand up? Yeah, mine was almost like opposite, where it's like as someone who was diagnosed as a kid when I was really young with ADHD, and like when you get older and then you start to think about it, you kind of start to question, like, what if I don't have ADHD and this is just like the what normal is? And I'm just like, like, I don't, and maybe I'm just maybe it's just that everybody's having trouble with this and people don't talk about it. You know, and you get into like this weird headspace, you're like, I have been like 
but then you, you don't really know what other people's experiences are mm. in this idea. And so then you kind of go down this hole of like, well, I've been told I have ADHD and I, it's not something that's been contested. Like everybody's like, especially for me, when I was diagnosed, everybody's like, that makes sense, you know? And my dad has ADHD as well, or he has ADD. And um, then you get into this thing, where, but then you still get to the, go into that same mental, like, I don't wanna say like spiral, cause it's not like a, that big of an issue, but more like the circle of thinking as to like, to what degree is this also potentially just like, if things are okay now in a certain degree, like, and it was just a struggle at the time, like at, at what point does it stop being ADHD if it's, if it's no longer like, a, like I don't wanna say debilitating, but like as, as it no longer affects the ability to function in the same way because of the systems mm. that are put in place to be able to go through it, you know? And, but then and like, that's the way that it kind of circles around. And it's not really like a definitive answer that I'm giving by any means. It's more just like a, a train of thought that kind of like circles into like, what, what does it even really mean in a lot of ways? I don't know. The pragmatic questions are perhaps often the best one. I would ask something like, or recognize say, well, clearly I struggled as a child. The best way that we found to make sense of it was this ADHD package uh, with its ritual package. And it did the job to an extent and it didn't to another. And where am I at now? Is this still working for me? Can I, can I try another model? I think most, most people go through that. It, it, it again points to the elusive nature of these, these conditions. Whereas um, after a cancer diagnosis, you know, one undergoes you know, chemotherapy, maybe radiotherapy, and then it's like, well, is the tumor still there or not? Is it malignant or not? It's not that simple. With, uh, um, and thankfully so, in, in, in a sense. But recall that for ADHD, the realist constructivist debate still rages because uh, as was well presented by the group, there are much, much higher rates in weird countries, but the rest of the world appears to be catching up, which prompts the realist to say, well, finally, we're able to diagnose it there. Uh, and others say, no, 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 they're just being colonized by it or, or some of the environmental stressors having to do with not so much the failure of late capitalism, so rising individualism, uh, less responsibilities towards others, who knows? Also access to schooling. Access to schooling, as we've seen, is both, uh, is mostly a risk factor for, <laughs> for developing ADHD, because in a context where one does not have to sit for eight hours a day and one finds something else to do, um, there might be ways for that phenotype to express itself. Uh, but again, for something like ADHD, uh, we could adopt that kind of biocultural active placebo approach where it, it seems we have been able to identify, again, a, a phenotype, perhaps let's even call it a personality type of kind of high novelty seeker, you know, fidgety with different subtypes. But as we've seen, and it was very, as was very well presented, this type itself does not predict distress outside of an environment and the specific constraints that it, it brings upon subjects. People's body language, tells me that the class is now over. Thank you for showing me. So I release you um, and I will see you all next week. Mm. Yeah, it's going to be great. Oh, here it is. Thank <laughs> you.